Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Well, I too want to welcome you to Center Street Church and to our central campus here at this location. And uh, welcome to those of you worshiping with us online and uh, on this, boy, wintry Thanksgiving weekend. So I think we should all talk about summer a little bit and go to that happy place for just a few moments. <clears throat> this past summer, there were 12 families from Center Street Church that went on a missions trip to Vancouver. And um, while we were down in uh, ministering and serving in downtown East Vancouver at a park one afternoon, <clears throat> excuse me, I mentioned, I, I met a young man there and began a dialogue with him that lasted about you know, 30 minutes or so. And he, he began sharing with me about his life. He had lived in Ontario. He um, had a good job in Ontario as a forklift operator. He had a girlfriend in uh, Ontario that he was committed to. He had his family in, Vancou in Ontario. He, um, his parents went to church and were Christians. He wasn't. So he just shared with me all about his life, of what life was like for him in Ontario. And then we got to the point in the conversation, well, what was he doing here in a park in East Vancouver, or downtown? And what he mentioned to me was that he had become discontent in life. He um, was just feeling bored in life, with life. Discontented to the point that he decided that he was going to leave everything behind and travel across the country. He left his girlfriend, he left his parents, he left his job, he sold his possessions and just made this dramatic change in life, left everything behind, was traveling across the country, living homeless, struggling to make ends meet, struggling to find a place to sleep at night, and uh, was working just as a vagrant worker at different places wherever he could find a job. He was discontent, and that was what caused him to make this dramatic shift in his life. And talking with him for about 30 minutes or so, he still was discontent. He still wasn't feeling joy and contentment in life. His solution was to strip everything away, live with less, eliminate clutter. On the other hand, try to navigate these massive challenges of just finding a place to sleep at night and not be robbed of the few possessions that he still had with him. Feeling discontent can lead us to make dramatic changes. To find contentment, sometimes we do make adjustments to our schedule, to our pattern of life, to declutter our house or, or uh, strip things away or focus on relationships that matter most. Sometimes we do that. Other times to find contentment, we bring more things into our life, add more things to our life in order to be content. It doesn't matter if you are married or if you are single or rich or poor. Your ethnicity doesn't matter. Your age doesn't matter. Every human heart at one time or another struggles with contentment, finding contentment. Being content. It's a universal problem. Our society, today we are wealthier than we have ever been, but unhappier than ever. We're more prosperous than ever, but more depressed and less satisfied. We have faster transportation than we've ever achieved in human history, and yet we're so quick to say, well, it's not fast enough. I mean, have you heard about this? We may soon have self-driving vehicles. Perhaps soon but we're already complaining about them, and they're not even here yet. How many countries have more suicides than homicide? Many countries have more suicides than homicides. We have more services, more technology, but we're not more content, we're not more satisfied. And this is one of the paradoxes, right, in our world today that we struggle with. We can experience so much, and yet we struggle with contentment. And so I want us to look at a passage of Scripture this morning, a remarkable passage. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13, where Paul says this, I have learned the secret of being content. 
in any and every situation. There's a secret to experiencing contentment. It's not easily found, but it can be learned. It can be learned. Just by way of confession here, I have at times and still struggle with my heart displaced, my heart seeking after other things and being discontent. In my past, if I wasn't discontent with my singleness, I was discontent in the job I had or discontent with the amount of money I was being paid to do the job I had. I remember one time I was working at a summer job and I was trying to get the courage up to ask my boss for a raise. So in my mind, I said, okay, I'm going to talk to him this day. Well, that day came and went and I never talked to him. That happened a number of times. So finally I did meet with him and chat with him, and I was struggling to find the words to say. I was so nervous and, and just bumbling around with my words till finally my boss said, Kent, are you trying to ask me for a raise? Is that what, is that what you're trying to say here? And I said, yeah, I am. And so he said, well, how much do you want? And I it was completely unexpected that he would ask me that, so I mentioned, you know, what I'd like to make per hour, and he said, okay, done. You got a raise. And as soon as I walked away from that conversation, I was discontent because I thought I didn't ask for enough. I should have negotiated a bit more. So easily, so easily at times just discontent. In recent years, I know there's aspects of my life that I struggle with being content in. So I want you to know I have not learned to completely be content in every situation in life like Paul is talking about here. I'm still on my way, still learning by God's grace, and I know I'm not alone in this. I'm not alone in this. And so for the remainder of our time together this morning, I want us to first of all define what is contentment. We'll define it. What is being content? And then we're going to look at why it is that we struggle so often with being content in every situation. Why do we struggle? And then I want us to look at how we can learn to be content. So first of all, what is it? Second, why do we struggle with it? And third, then how do we learn to be content? What's the secret that Paul is talking about here? So I want to read for us Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. Paul says this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. What Paul is saying here in the verses prior is he's thanking these Christians in Philippi for actually sending him a gift, for helping him, for supporting him in some way. He was saying here, well, you didn't have the opportunity to help me before, but now you have helped me, so I'm grateful for that. He goes on to say, but I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. What's remarkable here is that as Paul is writing these words, he's in Rome, writing to the Christians in Philippi. He's in Rome and he's in prison. He's waiting for his trial that will most likely bring about his death, his execution. And he's writing these words. I've learned to be content. Many of you know what else Paul experienced during his lifetime. He was imprisoned many times. He was flogged. He was exposed to death again and again. Five times he was beaten with 39 strikes. Five times. Three times beaten with rods. Once he had stones hurled at him. Three times he was shipwrecked. Spent a night and a whole day at the open sea. He was constantly on the move in danger all the time. And yet he can say, I have learned To be content. Wouldn't it be remarkable if we could say that as well? We've learned to be content in any and every situation. So, what is contentment? What is it exactly? It's interesting that Paul uses this the word here for contentment. He uses a Greek word, 
And this is the only place in the whole New Testament that this Greek word is used. And Paul borrows it from Greek philosophers. And Paul uses that word here. And what it means in its, in its just specific definition is completely self-sufficient. And Paul borrows this term from Greek philosophers who really thought that the way to reach contentment was to eliminate all emotion from our lives. Eliminate emotion, eliminate desires, eliminate longing, kill love, outlaw caring, get rid of our desires, and achieve contentment simply by our will and our mind. Although Paul uses this word, he does not mean this at all. This is not what he's talking about here. This is not the way that Paul is suggesting to seek contentment. 1 Timothy Chapter 6, Paul says, For we brought nothing into the world. We cannot take anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Hebrews 13 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? See, the Bible speaks here content to contentment not being found in materialism and wealth and prosperity and all that this world can bring. Instead, the Bible teaches that our source of contentment is found beyond what we experience in earthly things and possessions. And it's found in, in God's presence with us by his Holy Spirit. It's found in in the Lord being our helper and our advocate. And he will never leave us. And the Lord is the one who helps us to not be afraid no matter what situation we find ourselves in. Jeremiah Burroughs defines contentment this way. Contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Contentment is that spirit that freely submits to God's wise and fatherly action and provision in every condition. Contentment is being at rest and peace in the middle of our situation, knowing that God is sovereign. Contentment is having or is is wanting what you already have, not wanting what we don't have. It's wanting what God has provided for us, knowing that God is for you, that God is with you, that God is your helper, that with God you don't need to be afraid of any situation or circumstance, but you trust in him as a good father who loves you and has your best interests in mind. You see, contentment is not found through self-sufficiency. Contentment is not found through self-sufficiency, but, but in God who is completely sufficient for us in every situation. So if this is what contentment is, then why do we struggle being content so much of the time? What is it in us that just causes us to be this way? Well, one simple answer is that we covet Meaning we want things, we want experiences, we want stuff, we want relationships, we want fill in the blank, we want that. And we don't have it. We don't have it right now. We struggle with contentment because we struggle with the 10th commandment. Exodus 20 says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. First John chapter 2 says something similar. Where John here just says that much of our world seduces us and pressures us and, and drives us to lust and desire things that are not ours. The lust of our flesh. Where we... We long for pleasure, wherever we can find pleasure. The lust of our eyes where we we covet material possessions and things and stuff that we don't have. And the pride of our life that causes us to just yearn for fame and prestige and approval and the applause of people. These cultural forces wage war against us continually, relentlessly. 
causing us to, to covet. George Harrison was one of the Beatles. The Beatles being one of the greatest, most influential pop bands of all time. Harrison knew fame and fortune and wealth. He had experienced everything that fame and fortune could bring to him. And he says this, when you've had all the experiences, met all the famous people, made some money, toured the world, got all the acclaim, you still think, is that it? Is that it? Some people might be satisfied with that, but I wasn't and I'm still not. Can you imagine the discontentment in his heart? I just want to be clear here. When I speak about discontentment in this manner, I'm not talking about a holy and good discontent. There is a holy and a good and a righteous discontentment that we experience in our lives. When we long for God, we long for more of an intimacy and more communion and relationship with Him, to know about Him. And we long for God's values to be expressed in this world. Values like justice and compassion and forgiveness and love and mercy. And we want Jesus to return. There's a good discontentment. Not talking as well about a, a good, healthy ambition. There is a good, healthy ambition where we want to live our lives completely becoming the people that God had in mind for us to become. A, an ambition to utilize our spiritual gifts and our natural talent to influence this world for the gospel. There's a good and a healthy ambition. When I speak about discontentment here, I'm speaking about really what the Bible talks about, murmuring and grumbling and complaining and frustration and a lack of gratitude to God for what he has done in our lives. You see, our discontentment reveals some things about us. It reveals our pride and our ego and our arrogance. Where at times we actually think that we know better, better plan, better agenda for our lives than God does. We would never say it that way because that just sounds awful to say it that way. But we at times think we can manage our lives better than we think God does. Some people might be tempted to think, you know what, the spouse I have is not the right spouse for me. God made a mistake. And so I'm going to search for someone else. You might think this way, if someone in your, your workplace gets a promotion or gets some sort of affirmation or approval or some applause, you might think, no, that was mine. I deserve that. I'm supposed to be getting this promotion and elevated in my company or organization. And we think that we... We can run our lives better than, than God can. And at times we do make decisions ahead of God, outside of his plan and purpose for our lives. We do what we want to do. Discontentment reveals our sense of entitlement, where we believe that we deserve something from God that we don't already have, that he owes us something. God is somehow indebted to us because we're good people or whatever rationale we can come up with in our mind. But here's the thing, entitlement moves us to trust God for what we feel we deserve. So we trust him for those friendships. We trust him for that salary. We trust him for that relationship, that girlfriend, that boyfriend. We trust him only if he will make us happy. And when that doesn't happen, our trust in God just evaporates. Because we're only actually trusting him for the things that we want. We don't trust him in areas that we might experience disappointment in. On this Thanksgiving weekend, I want to tell you that discontentment will keep you from experiencing gratitude. Discontentment will kill, it will eradicate, it will suffocate gratitude and thankfulness in your life. That's what discontentment will do. Because contentment is the foundation for being thankful. And think of this room, when we come and worship, how can we worship God when we have discontentment in our heart towards him? We can sing songs, but we can't worship. You see, we become so mindful of what we want that what we don't have suffocates our ability to be thankful and express gratitude to the people around us and to God for what he has done in our lives. And if you are a Christian here this morning, 
God has saved you by his grace, which is the best news in the world. God has saved you by his grace. You and I were once orphans. We had no dad. But God chose you on his own initiative of grace. He chose you and he adopted you to be a part of his family forever. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. He's forgiven your sins, all of them, past, present, future. He's opened your spiritual eyes. He's healed your crippled heart. He's made you aware of his love and his wisdom. You see, when our hearts are discontent within us, when we want something we don't have, when things don't go as we had planned, and we're discontent, it spreads into every area of our life. It spreads into our singleness. When we just feel like, I can't be single, I want a, a, a spouse, I want to meet someone. It spreads into our singleness. It spreads into our marriage where we become discontent with our spouse and we're disappointed, we're frustrated, we're angry, we're bitter, we're resentful, whatever it is at them. And we think, why did I marry this person? It spreads into there. It spreads into our, our parenting where we feel annoyed or discontent with our children. We think, whose kids are these anyway? It spreads into our finances where we're discontent if our bank account only shows so much. We're not content. We're discontent. It spreads into our sexuality, our vocations, into our worship experience. We become discontent in the church and think, well, the church isn't doing things the way that, that I want them to be done. And something's got to change. And we become discontent. It spreads everywhere. There's no facet of our life that becomes protected from our discontented hearts. And at the bottom line, underneath all of this, What's driving, what's compelling our discontentment is what the Bible calls idolatry. Beneath every grumbling, beneath every murmur, beneath every complaining, beneath every frustration, the sin beneath the sin is that we want something more than we want God. We long for something more than we long for Him. We love something else more than we love God. We trust in something else to make us content more than we trust in Jesus to enable us to be in content in any and every situation. We're chasing after something else. And if this is you this morning, then the right action is to just confess that. Say, God, I'm sorry. I confess that I have longed for, I've sought after, I want something else more than I want you. That's wrong, I confess that. Please forgive me. And then take that step and say, but I will trust in you, Jesus. Strengthen me with the circumstance, the situation, the relationship. Strengthen me with whatever I'm in right now because I want to trust in you. That's the response to our contentment. Where then we love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. So we've looked at defining what is contentment. Just explored why we struggle, right, with contentment. So how do we actually learn to be content? What's that journey? What's that process to learn to be content? Paul says twice in this passage that he's learned to be content. That should give us hope. That should give us hope because we can. We can attain contentment. It can be. We can get there. Paul wasn't an extraordinary person. He was ordinary, just like us. And he says, I've learned to be content. It gives us hope. But what this means is that contentment doesn't come naturally to us. We just don't drift into being content one day. We need to learn. We need to work at it. And learning contentment is contrary to our normal patterns, our normal way of thinking. It is so countercultural to our world, it's amazing. For example, the world will say this if you want to be content, you need to get yourself out of that bad situation as quickly as possible. Get yourself out of there. The Bible says that we're to find contentment in the middle of even the most difficult circumstances. And it's possible. 
Our world says, if you want to be content, then get what you want in this world. Strive after it, use power, control, use whatever means, get what you want in this life, and then you will be content. The Bible teaches that true contentment comes by being satisfied with God's plan and God's provision for you. Contentment requires trusting God. Trusting God. Read this verse with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. If you struggle with discontentment, memorize this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own way of thinking, your own wisdom, your own knowledge. Don't lean on your own. Acknowledge him. Trust in him. And he'll direct you. You see, in our desire to be content, we can't think like the rest of the world. We can't rely on our own understanding or what makes sense to us. Instead, Learning to be content is a slow process in just saying, I will trust in you, Jesus. I'll rest in you. I'll depend on you. Every feeling of discontent that we have within us should be a signal. It should be like just a a light bulb going off in our mind. Where when we feel discontent, we say, okay, God, I'm feeling this way. I don't understand what's going on in my life right now. I don't understand my circumstances. I don't like my circumstances. I'm uncomfortable. I'm discontent. And I don't like the way I'm feeling. But God, I'm going to trust in you. And until you show me otherwise, until you show me what's going on here, I will strive by your strength to be content, to trust in you, and to wait on you. See, when we feel discontentment, that's how we should be praying, trusting in God. Roy Campanella was one of the first African-American players to play in the U.S. baseball major leagues, right? He had an incredibly distinguished career, won the MVP player many times. In the 1955 World Series, he was on the team that won the World Series, But three years later, in 1958, his career ended tragically through a car accident that left him a quadriplegic. Think of how he would approach life after that, the discontentment he might feel. And so he began this rehabilitation process in New York City, and as he was moving along the hallways of this rehab center, he read a plaque that hung on the wall that resonated deeply with how he had come to see life through this tragic experience. And these are the words that he read on this plaque. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked for health that I might do great things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise and the applause of others. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I am among men most richly blessed. You see, church, we have to We have to learn and work at changing the way that we strive to be happy, to be full of joy, to be content in this life. The key idea here is that we have to unlearn the normal ways that our world has just shaped us and moved us to cause us to approach this topic. We have to relearn how to find contentment according to God's agenda. The secret that Paul is talking about here is this, that our world seeks contentment and trusting in their own ability, in their own strength, in their own power, in their own might, in their own control, in their own manipulation, and whatever they might try and do to strive at finding contentment, but it's hidden. It's a secret. That's not the way to find contentment. Instead, contentment is found through only trusting 
and surrendering and submitting to God. Sometimes God is gracious to us and shows us why we're in the situation that we're in. And sometimes he doesn't do that for some time. But we have a God who loves us. And who has our best interest at heart. And that requires trust from us. Listen to what Paul says again. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. See this last verse here is sometimes used out of context. It's sometimes used in ways that it's not intended to be used. Some people take this verse to mean that there's nothing a Christian can't do because God is giving them strength, strengthening him or her. It almost becomes like a motivational self-help sort of verse in which people grit their teeth and say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things. And, and it's just used in that sort of way. I'm 41 years old, I'm 5'11", and I weigh average, <clears throat> just average. But here's the thing, no matter how hard I try, no matter how hard I train, no matter how much I pray and quote this verse, I will never play in the NHL. Never. It just won't happen. No matter how much I pray, how much I train, it won't happen. You see, it's important to note here, when Paul says, I can do all things, he doesn't mean that God gives you and I the ability to do whatever we want. He doesn't give us power to make changes and, and to bring about things in our lives, even good things at times. Instead, Paul is referring here to God empowering his people to acquire this Christian virtue of contentment. Being content wherever God leads us. And so what Paul is saying here, I can do all things through him who gives me strength, meaning I can do poor through God who gives me strength. I can do rich and wealthy through God who gives me strength. I can do hungry through God who gives me strength. I can feast, be content in that through God who gives me strength. I can do prison. I can do sick. I can do dying. I can do persecution through God who gives me strength. I can, I can do ridicule. I can do depression. I can be married through God who gives me strength. I can be single through God who gives me strength. I can be widowed through God who gives me strength. I can do all things and be content through God who gives me strength. Amen. That's what Paul is saying here. You can fill in the blank with whatever it is that's on your heart right now. You see, contentment comes not by making our circumstances suitable to us. Hear what I'm saying here. Contentment comes not by making our circumstances suitable to us, but by God, by His Spirit, strengthening our inner being so that we can be content in every situation. God designed us to operate on trust. He designed us to operate on trust. God made us in his image. Right? He gave us knowledge and wisdom. And he even gave us power. But our power is very limited. Our knowledge is very limited. Our wisdom is very limited. So God designed us to trust in him. So that when our knowledge and our wisdom and our power reaches its limit. Then he made us to trust in him in his knowledge, and his power, and his wisdom. And to find contentment and strength in that. Because he's far beyond us. We're meant to trust 
in Jesus. Contentment is only found in trusting in Jesus. And so he has given us this very simple but hard secret of saying, trust me. Trust in me. Find contentment in me. I'd like us to bow our heads now and just spend some time in prayer. I just want to ask a few questions as we just prayerfully reflect on what God is saying to us. How are you doing in this area of being content? How are you really doing if you're honest with yourself? What's the state of your heart? In what areas of your life are you discontent? Your feelings of discontentment are an opportunity for you today to deepen your trust in Jesus Christ. It's an opportunity for you to respond and say, Jesus, even though I don't understand, I will trust in you. It's an opportunity to confess that you've been chasing, seeking, loving, trusting something else other than Jesus Christ. Whatever the source of your discontentment, can you trust Jesus with it? Will you trust him with it? If there's something that's eating you up inside, causing you anxiety, worry, stress, frustration, grumbling, complaining, whatever it is. And if you want to trust Jesus today, I just want to ask you to raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're actually just saying, I will trust in you, Jesus. It's an act of testifying. It's an act of witness. It's an act of faith saying, I will trust you, Jesus, with this this thing, this relationship, this person. Those of you that are raising your hands, what you're saying is, I trust you, Jesus. That's great. You can put your hands down in Let's pray together. Jesus, these hands that have been raised are a cry to you. They're a cry to you to come and strengthen. Enable these individuals, my friends here this morning, who want to trust you at a deeper level than they're currently experiencing now. And by your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would strengthen them in their inner being so that they would be able to testify and say, I can do this through you, Jesus, who give me strength, not through my own power, my own ability, my own strength, my wealth, whatever it is, but through you. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would give them so much courage and boldness and bring this sweet contentment into their life right now. Jesus, as a church, help us to trust in you guide us to live lives of obedience to you, not seeking after anything else, not longing after anything else, not finding fulfillment or satisfaction or pleasure in anything else ultimately but you. Forgive us. Forgive us when we have not done that. Forgive us, Jesus. We surrender our lives to you anew again today. On this Thanksgiving weekend, we express hearts of gratitude, such incredible gratitude for what you have done for us. We're so fickle, children of yours. (laughs) We get distracted so easily. But this morning, we elevate you, Jesus, to the highest place in our lives. Our king above every other king, our leader above every other leader, our Lord and our savior, our redeemer and our friend. It's you, Jesus. We love you worship you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Help us to find our contentment in you and you alone. Thank you for your strength. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you, give you strength. May he guide you by his Holy Spirit speaking to you each and every day, each and every moment. 
in all you do and all you say, may you bring honor and glory to his name, his name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. 